I assume you have a birthday now and then. Yeah. For the party? Mm-hmm. Well, here's a good centerpiece for a birthday party. It's called dancing spaghetti. Oh. <laughs> Some people eat it, you know, you know, and so forth, but I make it dance. Now, here's what you need to have make a good centerpiece. Get a big container of water. You don't mm -hmm. have to have a beaker like this, brandy snifter or anything like that. Great big pitcher. And in it, I have dissolved two heaping tablespoons of sodium bicarbonate, otherwise known as what? Um, baking soda. Yeah, yeah. baking the soda. Chemical name is sodium bicarbonate. Yeah. Here is some vinegar. Mm -hmm. You know what happens when vinegar and sodium bicarbonate get together? Yeah, it bubbles up. Mm -hmm. What's in the bubbles, you know? Air. No, no, not air. Uh, you know about acid and bases? Yeah, a little bit. Okay. Vinegar is what? An acid. An acid, right. You can almost... Acid meaning sort of acidy, bitter. Yeah. Um, that's vinegar. Baking soda dissolved in water is a base. When the two of them get together, what they release is carbon dioxide gas. Okay? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Here's the spaghetti. Break it up into pieces about five centimeters or so long and toss them in there. Okay. Notice they're heavier than water, so they sink yeah. to the bottom. Mm -hmm. But they're just slightly heavier than water. And that's important as you see what's coming up in a moment. Okay. Now the next trick is to get them to dance. <laughs> what will happen when we pour the vinegar in here because there's sodium bicarbonate dissolved in the water? Um, the... Okay, the vinegar bubbles, it'll start to bubble up and then the air bubbles will go will um, cling on to the spaghetti. To the spaghetti, and that will make them float. Yeah. Well, let's try it first and see. Go ahead, you pour the vinegar, okay. and I'll stir it. Okay. Oh, see all those little bubbles in there? That's what that yeah. cloudiness is. Mm -hmm. Those are the bubbles of carbon dioxide. Yeah. Now, if it doesn't work immediately, add just a little more vinegar. There we go. Now, see the bubbles of carbon dioxide gas are making the, the, um, each of the little pieces of spaghetti lighter. Then yeah. what happens when it gets to the top? The air bubbles go, the Carbon pop dioxide and, bubbles. Yeah, well, the carbon dioxide yeah. bubbles, um, when they reach the top, they'll open up and the, then the air will come off. The, the, carbon, <laughs> the carbon dioxide bubbles yeah. will come off, right? Will come off the pieces of spaghetti. And, and then, then they get heavier. Get, yeah, and then uh, they go down to the bottom. Okay. So if you want to help them a little bit, you can move it around like that and make them yeah. break them. So this mm -hmm. will go up and down for, oh, half an hour or so. Yeah. So all of your guests at your party will wonder, what the heck is going on with dancing spaghetti? <laughs> Mothballs also work, but here, smell it. It's a special kind of mothball made out of naphthalene. And you have to use only that kind. Try putting it? those in there. They're slightly heavier, too, about the yeah. same density as the spaghetti. In fact, they're going to the top real fast. Now, when it, when it dies down, then you add a little more vinegar. Stir it up a little bit, yeah. and they'll keep going. Mm -hmm. Then if you really want to get fancy, here, add a little bit of that. Drop it, too. A little more. Now you've had food coloring to match the decorations of the party. And there you have in a nice centerpiece. Mm -hmm. Centipede means 100 feet in Latin. Quick quiz. Do centipedes actually have 100 feet? Well, scientists have studied the 3,000 different kinds of centipedes and found that the legs at the front are modified into fangs that inject poison into prey. When a centipede hatches out of the egg, it has three pairs of legs like other insects. But as it grows and sheds its outside skeleton, it gradually adds more legs. An adult European variety has 340. But half of all centipedes, like this one, have only 15 pairs for a total of 30 legs. So the next time you meet an insect like this one, call it a centipede because that's its name, but realize it's probably missing 70 legs to actually live up to its name.
here I have a whole sink full of red water. I colored it with food coloring. Looks like it might be a soft drink, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess. But the reason I did that was that so you could see that when I pull a, this jar up so that the, it's way above the surface of the water. There's, here's the surface of the water down here, and it's what, six inches higher? And the water doesn't come yeah. out. Why? Have you How ever been in an office where, where people come up and take a drink and then they, and you see there's a tank on top and it bubbles? Yeah. Okay, well that... I, I've seen it. Yeah, and uh, there also, another version of it is uh, a chicken drinking fountain or for dogs. If you get a container of water and you fill it all the way to the top with, with water and then turn it upside down but keep the mouth of it under the water like this, air can't get in down there to push down on top of the water. So you can raise it, I remember it's about 34 feet. You could have a big column of water here because the air pressure pushing down on the surface of the water here keeps the water up. Now I'll raise it just a little bit as though somebody were taking a drink from the fountain. Remember what happens when they take a drink? Yeah, what? like air goes in and these bubbles come yeah, up. Yeah, bubbles like what? Yeah. Like that, right? Yeah. yeah. So as you take, as you let air in, water comes out. And if you, this were a chicken drinking fountain, as the chickens took more and more of the water away, as soon as the water level gets below the mouth of the thing, more water will come out. Now, you don't need to do it in a jar like this. It also works with a, with a glass. In fact, here, what? What you do is you put the glass underneath like this, mm -hmm. get it all full, and then when you turn it up, you can try that on your friends and have them say, you see, the water goes up six inches above the surface. Here, you try it. You better take your, pull your old sleeves up so you don't get them all wet. Okay, okay there are glasses on there. Just pick it up straight up there. Okay. Here, try this hand over here. Like that. Okay, pull it straight up. Hey. What? Why is it going down? Come on, Eugene. Turn it over here like that and pull it straight up. Okay. Water is supposed to stay up there. I know. I did the same way you did it on, to the... Not quite. What do you mean? Well, pull it up again. Okay. If the water goes out, what must be getting in on top? Air, like you told me before. Right. If air is air getting in there in. somehow. Yeah. Well, here's how I played this little trick on you. What I did was to take a, a nail and put it in a candle flame, holding mm -hmm. the nail in a pair of pliers. And then I stuck the nail in right there and made a little hole. So that when I did it, I put my thumb over the hole. And when I went underneath like this, I held my thumb on the hole. When you did it, you didn't know there was a hole in it, so you held it like that, right? Yeah. And air came in the hole, and down it went. So this time you try it, keep your finger over the hole. Okay. So that's the way you do it. You got your finger over the hole now? Okay, now pick it straight up. Aha! But when your friends do it, take your finger off the hole once. When your friends do it, down it'll go. Now this, this... Pretty tri tricky, pretty eh? Pretty tricky, and you can get your dad to help you because, you, you know, you're going to get a hot nail and, and yeah. put it through there so you don't want to burn yourself. Uh, this particular glass is also sold in a magic shop or in joke stores, and it's called a dribble glass. You know what dribble is? Yeah. You know when water dribbles out? And here's the reason why it's called a dribble glass. I will put it underneath the water with my thumb over the hole. And you mm -hmm. say to your friend, you got a good friend you'd like to play a trick on? Yeah. Who? Um, his name is, uh, what's his name? Donnie Chow. Donnie Chow? Okay. You say, yeah, Donnie, would you like a drink of water? And he says, well, sure. Or you could even have it colored with this and he'll think mm -hmm. it's some kind of a soft drink. And you say, okay, here, Donnie. And you hand it to him like that. <laughs>
They're together. Yeah, you clipped them together. How did that happen? Well, this is a trick that was invented by William Bowman. He's a magician who lives up in Seattle. And I don't wonder how he even invented it, because it all happens inside the piece of paper. Here, I'll show you first how to do it. Here's what you do. Get the piece of paper about this big. Okay. Fold it like that. All right. So what you want to do is clip these two parts together. So I'll, I'll do that part first. And we'll use two big paper clips this time. You like that? OK, now you clip that one and that one together. OK, clip this one and that one. Right. Okay, now slowly pull it. This time, just hold it straight up. Okay. Mm -hmm. They automatically go together. That's how to do it. Now, here's what happens. I have the same thing set up, but this time I have it in clear plastic. Here, take it. Now, slowly pull it, and watch what happens to those two inner parts. They're going together. Yeah, watch. Yeah. Watch. They're joining together. Right. Keep pulling. There. Okay. That's what makes them go together. Because those two folds, in effect, open the parts of the paper clip and put them together. I'll play this trick on my dad. You think he'd like that? Yeah. Good. You know how to do it now. Yes, I okay. do. <laughs> Good luck. By the time the ground is covered with snow like this, Many animals have migrated to warmer climates, but not all of them. Some are tucked snugly under the snow, spending the winter in a sleep-like state called hibernation. But this ground squirrel isn't in a burrow under the snow. It's in a cage at Loyola University in Chicago. There, Dr. Albert Daw and Wilma Spurrier investigated the mysteries of hibernation. 400 ground squirrels and a dozen woodchucks go about their normal lives eating rearing their young, and, of course, hibernating during the winter months. The cold of winter is duplicated in this special room at 5 degrees Celsius all year long. When a ground squirrel hibernates, its normal body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius drops to only 7 degrees, 2 degrees above the temperature of the chamber. Its heart rate drops from a normal 300 beats per minute to just 4 beats per minute. The scientists have found that even when the squirrels are kept in the cold room, they won't hibernate in the summer months. So it's not cold temperature that triggers hibernation. Could it be a change of some kind in the animal's blood? To find out, they waited until the winter months when the woodchucks were hibernating. Then they extracted some of the woodchucks' blood and stored it for six months. In June, they transfused the woodchucks' blood into active ground squirrels and placed them in the cold chamber. Within a few days, the squirrels began to hibernate. The scientists are now analyzing the blood of the animals to isolate and identify the exact chemical that acts as a trigger for that strange condition that allows an animal to exist with almost no air and no food or water for up to six months at a time, a condition that can no longer be called winter sleep, because now at Loyola University, the ground squirrels are sleeping all summer long. Have you any idea what this is, Christian? Well, maybe, it's a, is it a robot? What made you think that? Well, all the buttons and the funny looking arm. Mm -hmm. Well, it is a robot. A special kind of robot that's been designed to help train the people who are going to make the robots work in the future. How? Well, there are all kinds of switches here and all kinds of panels inside and an arm there and so forth so that uh, the students can practice uh, programming and understand how they work. Have you ever seen uh, an animal count? Oh, yeah, once. I remember in a circus, um, there was a horse and the trainer would yell out a number like three and then the horse would just stamp three times. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, this time you're going to be the horse and this... Robot will be the trainer, not really. What, you, what I want you to do is to make a sound, and then the robot is going to hear the sound and then tell you that it was one. Or you make uh, three sounds, and the robot will hear, uh, hear that and say three. Now, the reason why they want to do this, it's a relatively simple idea, just you know, counting. But in the future, if a robot is going to understand voices or be able to recognize a person's voice, 
they have to be able to program it so that it could recognize the loud sounds mm -hmm. and the spaces between them. So this is a simple program to uh, work on that idea. Wow. So here's the sound you're going to make. Instead of stamping your feet, take the spoon and hit the bottom of this plastic pail over here. And I'll turn on uh, the robot by pushing the B button over here. And then don't make any sound except this, because it'll hear it. Are you ready? OK, quiet. <laughs> wow, I never thought robots get tired. <laughs> well, they sure do, and actually the man programmed in the dinner to say that. Wow. Mm -hmm. You've heard about computers that are very fast at making calculations, right? Yeah. Well, you have one of those inside your head. I do? Yeah, it's called a brain. Oh. And it's very, very good at making very quick calculations. In fact, what we're gonna do is test the combination of your ears and your brain by doing a hearing test. Here okay. are two spoons that I'll click together like that. But I'll do it behind your head. Okay. When you hear the sound coming from the right-hand side, you hold up that hand. From the left-hand side, you hold that hand. And when you hear it from the middle, both hands. Okay. okay. We'll check your hearing. <clears throat> Okay, put your hands down. Okay. Now, do you realize how amazing that is? No. No? Well, you do that all the time, and you don't even think about it. Actually, what was happening, when I clicked the spoon, and I was on this side, this ear registered the sound, and so did that ear on that side. And your brain was able to calculate the difference in the arrival time between those two, and say, oh, the sound must be coming from there because it came to this ear first. And you realize the distance between your two ears is, what, six inches or something like that, so we're able to detect the difference in how long it took sound to travel six inches. Amazing. Now, I will fool you, so be careful. I want you to put this tube, which is from a piece of paper towel, right? Okay, and put it up here at your ear. And now I'm going to do the same thing again. This time you're going to have to use just one hand. Okay. Are you ready? Over here. Over here. The middle. Okay, look. Hold the tube like that. And pretend that's, that, that's on your ear. I did it over here first, right? And you got it. Then I did it over here, and you got it. Then I did it over here, and you said to the left. And when I was about right there, you said in the center. <sighs> Why? Because... I thought it was the middle because of the, the sound has to go through the tube to get to my ear and right. it takes longer. If, well, as a matter of fact, if we did some very accurate measurements, we'd probably find that there was almost exactly the same distance from the spoons to that ear as it was from the spoon all the way over here to this ear. And your brain was able to detect the difference in that much distance at the speed of sound. So you have very good ears. Congratulations. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. You probably recognize these as belonging to the famous pitcher plant family. This variety grows in bogs of northern United States and southern Canada. They secrete a sweet-smelling nectar that attracts insects. Once inside, the insects slide down the slippery walls into the water at the bottom. Downward pointing hairs prevent it from escaping and it soon drowns. Digestive enzymes and bacteria in the water will gradually digest the yellow jacket trapped by the innocent-looking pitcher plant.
Lila's all set to drop a piece of cardboard and a softball at the same time. Which one will hit the ground first, Michael? Well, the ball should hit first. Okay, Lila. Bombs away. Yep. Very definitely, right? Why? It's because of the aerodynamics of the ball. What's that mean? Well, when the air passes over the ball, it passes through the sides quickly. Yeah. And when the air passes through that, it doesn't pass as quickly because it's got a bigger surface. Bigger surface. So there's more resistance of the yeah. air. Yeah. Then now Lala's going to drop them like that at the same time. Well, then they should both hit the ground at the same time. Ready? Yeah. Back up so she doesn't hit you on the head, Michael. Here they come. Yeah. You were right. Now, why did they work this time? Well, because um, it had a greater weight on this surface. Part, so, you know, a greater weight? And uh, the air traveled right. faster over. This one went down in the, in the shadow of this one, yeah. sort of, so to speak. OK, now she's going to drop a softball and a golf ball at the same time. Which one will hit first? Well, they should hit the ground at the same time. Now, remember, the, go the golf ball is lighter. So it doesn't matter. You sure? Yeah, I'm positive. OK. Both at the same time. Right you were. Come on down, Miss Galileo. She's on the Leaning Tower of Pisa. You remember that story? Yeah. Yeah, Galileo did that. Thank you very much. You're, You're very good at dropping balls. <laughs>